Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verses 235 to 238, which read as follows. Pandupalaso vadanisi Yamapurisa pitate upatita Uyoga mukhe chatiptasi Pate yampi chate navijati So karohi di pamatano Kipang vayama pandito bhava Nidantamalo anangano Dibang arya booming upehisi Upanitavayo upanitavayo jadani si Sampayat Sampayato si Yamasa Santikang Waso te nati antara Pa te yampi chate navichati So karohi di pamatano Kipang wa yama pandito bawa Nidhantamalo Nidhantamalo anangano Napuna jati charang upehisi which means you are now like a withered leaf the people of yama wait for you yama is death the people the the messengers of death the servants of death the realm of the dead waits for you you stand at the entrance or the beginning of a long journey but you don't have but there are no there are no discern, but you have no discernible provisions what you need to take with you on the journey make yourself a refuge quickly and hastily Cultivate effort, become wise, wise up. When you are when you have expelled the stains, the dust, blown away the dust in your mind, and are free from defilement, then you will go to to heaven, to the realm of the nobles, to a good place, to the realm of the nobles. Now you are very old, advanced in age. You are going to the realm of death. And there is no vaso tenatiantara. There will be no, no uh, resting along the way. This journey that you're going on. It's not like once you started you can say, wait, wait, wait. And there will be no rest. Once you di die, it's too late already. And you don't have any provisions for the journey. Pate yampi chati navi chati. Can't. I don't see. I don't see any. I don't see that you've packed. So karohi dipamatano. Make a refuge for yourself. Quickly. Exert yourself. Become wise. Be wise, wise up. Having blown away the dust, being free from defilement, you will not again come to old age and death. So four verses, two, two sets, as you can probably tell. The, the first two and the second two, the first and second, are almost repeated with the third and fourth. These were supposed to have been taught in response to uh, a man who was the son of, he was identified as the son of a cow killer, a slaughterer of cattle. And so the story begins with his father 
who died a horrible death after butchering cows his whole life. But that doesn't have anything really to do with the story, except that it puts in context the teaching. So I might as well go, go, go into it. The, this man, his father, had his whole life killed slaughtered cows, never done anything good, never exerted himself in in charity or or morality obviously not to speak of anything like meditation he never thought about any any good deeds any way of bettering himself his way of bettering himself was to kill cows and he was addicted to eating meat one day he didn't have any meat so he he saw his he had his one uh, ox and I guess it wasn't a, a, a meat cow. It was an ox used for plowing fields or something. And he saw it and he reached into its mouth and cut out its tongue while it was still alive. And then he cooked it up, or had his wife cook it up probably. And then he sat down and picked it up with his fork and his knife and speared it on his knife. And you know, it was so... Uh, caught up in his his own evil you know that anger makes you so reckless and he was so caught up in it that he apparently shoved the, the knife into his mouth and stabbed his own tongue the commentary tells this story it's it's if it actually happened which uh, i can't verify but it's a real example of the of of a rare occurrence of instant karma instant retribution he cut his tongue and started howling with pain and went fell down on his knees and and started twisting and turning and crawling around like a like a cow you know the commentary describes it that way quite apt actually because i think we don't acknowledge enough how the, the potential for this to happen it doesn't happen all the time obviously but that there is some consequence that puts you in the position of those beings that you hurt this is part of the, the nature of karma sometimes and to varying degrees but a person who kills is going to suffer and often will suffer in very similar ways to the beings that they've made to suffer. And so this guy apparently crawling around just like a, walking on all fours like an animal and writhing with blood in his mouth and his tongue. And he died. His son took after his father to some extent. I don't think he was a butcher, but he went to, or lived in Takasila, but just the same, never thought to do any good deeds. Never thought to do any good. Had 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 got married, had some children, and his children moved to Sawati, where the Buddha was living, and became followers of the Buddha. And after following the Buddha and learning the Buddha's teaching, they realized that they had to do something for their father. So they invited him eventually to come and live with them. Good kids supporting their parents after their parents supported them. This is a good Buddhist thing, I think. We often deride in the West this, this culture of supporting your parents in old age. We often, in, in, the, in the West, we... In some cultures anyway, in, in the cultures that I'm familiar with, we look more to the future. My parents took care of me, so I'll take care of my children. And we forget about our parents. Which, to some extent, it, it, it makes sense, you know. They looked after us, well, let's follow their example, look after our children. But life doesn't work that way. And this is a bit of a tangent, but it's an important reminder that... Our parents get old to, and, and eventually can't work. It's a very obvious thing that eventually they can't take care of themselves. Or they, they can't care for themselves in terms of working the way they used to. They can still be perfectly capable, but they are often unable to do the work that they used to do. And to some extent they shouldn't have to. 
after some time we acknowledge in society that they should be able to retire. And part of that that right, you know, the rightness of them being able to retire is that their children should look after them. I think it's a good culture. It's a good thing for us to think of. So these these children I think had the right of it, inviting him and much more the right of it by thinking of his spiritual well being, thinking that they would bring him to the Buddha and have him learn the Buddha's teaching. And they did this. They invited the Buddha to their house and they brought they said they brought the father out and said, This is our father and uh, I think the Buddha realized right away that this guy was not so much inclined towards good things. And so the Buddha taught him the first two verses, saying that he wasn't, you're old, look at you. You're like a, a leaf ready to fall from the tree. But you're not ready to die. You're not in a position where you can cope, where you are, would be able to. You're not capable of, of facing death. You're not up to the task of dying, let's put it that way. You're going to fail at this death thing. Yeah, you're, you're, you're like a person ready to start on a journey, but you haven't even packed. So it'll be a terrible journey because you won't have any provisions. And the, the, the old man took this to heart. Especially thinking of his father, I think, and that's why that's why that first part actually does have some relevance. It reminded him quite likely of what it's like to die when you're not ready, when your mind is in a bad state. How horrible it would be to die like that. He realized that there is some connection that that the state of mind when you die has to be incredibly important. You know, whatever happens when you die, the the state of your mind is is the the cause of whatever comes next. It's going to color, it's going to affect, it's going to influence whatever happens, whatever it might be. And so thinking of his father and, and well, thinking of himself and realizing that he hadn't ever spent enough time thinking about or considering factoring death into the equation, right? Because often we think very much about how to better ourselves. We have a desire to be happy, of course. We have, all of us generally, a desire to better ourselves or better our position, our situation in some way. But the equation always, almost always, focuses entirely on bettering ourselves in the here and now. How can I get richer? How can I get uh, more things, more possessions? How can I associate with people who I, who I like and who will like me? Like-minded individuals. How can I be happier? How can I have more pleasure? And we don't relate ever to the fact that all of these things are going to one day be taken away from us. Even our whole, own body and, and our, all of our possessions are going to be taken away from us. And he was quite converted to the Buddha's way, of, to the, the, well, to following the Buddha, having seen and having experienced firsthand how wise the Buddha was and how apt his teaching was. And so they invited him back, and the next morning the Buddha taught the second two verses. That's the story. Doesn't say what happened then, but yeah, it was enough after the first two. So the main lesson here is really one of our reminding ourselves of the importance of spiritual practice. It's one of these teachings that doesn't really go into detail about how we should practice, but reminds us why we should practice, which is very important teaching. It's often a more important teaching once one has gained the basics and how to practice. Encouragement can often be more important, just
just encouraging us to go back and practice the things we already know, right? Because so quite often we hear about people who have learned all that they need to learn, and even practiced, but they fall away not because they don't know how to practice, but they don't know why they should practice. They can't bring themselves to understand why they should practice. And so here it is, it's about factoring into the equation of our own happiness Reminding ourselves not only that our ways of finding happiness are limited Meaning meaning they're not generally as conducive to happiness as we think But also that they are uh, What they are, they are circumscribed by death Meaning the, the range, how far we can take them And to what extent they can satisfy us Is always going to be limited by death So when we talk about preparing for death And that's what the Buddha uses here some, Sometimes I think the, the question might be Well why should we worry about the future? Why should we think about death when it isn't here and now? And, and to some extent that's a valid argument A valid question but the, the, we have to turn it on, on its head and say that the problem isn't that we don't think of death, really. The problem is that our equation is skewed. Our plan, our uh, life plan, our way of living our lives is, is, um, is wrong, I say. It's wrong because it doesn't take into account one of the most important factors And that is death If you say, look at my life, everything's good right? it's, good. it's quite obvious that, that most people's life plan Is missing some very important uh, Factoring you, know, you haven't factored in something very important like, But what about, what about this? What about this big glaring thing This elephant in the room that you've forgotten? This thing that will throw a very, very big monkey wrench into your plans. All the things that we accomplish in our life, they'll disappear. All of our learning, some people have learned, learn all the way to a PhD. Buddhist monks learn the whole Tipitaka. Pali, we learn Pali as Buddhist. Um... People learn languages, though. how many languages some people can speak Our friends, our possessions, our position in life Maybe we, got, we worked very hard to become a, a high-ranking individual in a company or in society We worked very hard to develop networks and plans We worked very hard to build houses and Lifestyles to, to pad our bank account Some people you know, Look at this Look at this Look what I've done Often it's based simply on A limited understanding of death So one thing that we should really Take in, into account with this teaching Is that we Is The need to understand death More deeply than most people do and this is a real lesson for us as meditators Part of how we prepare for death Like anything else Is to understand it You know, they, In war they say Understand your enemy Perhaps that's an apt Way of talking about this Understand the problem If you want to talk In terms of problems and solutions Which As I've said we often We really shouldn't we shouldn't put too much emphasis or, or focus on things in terms of being problems But if we look at them as problems Then the Buddhist response or the Buddhist solution to problems Is to understand them So understanding death In Buddhism there are three types of death We have momentary death We have conceptual death And then we have the... Uh, destructive death Death by cutting off But like it's the real absolute death In some sense 
literally death by cutting off, samucheda marana. Momentary death is the most real, it's, the, it's reality. Every moment we die, and then we're born again. Or more precisely, every moment experiences are born. Right? When you hear the sound of my voice, there's an experience. Every moment there, there's an experience. That experience wasn't there a moment ago, but that experience was born. And after the hearing stops, that experience is gone. It's died. So if we want to talk about reality, it's not really this person was born and then they died. That's a, a misleading way of describing it. But what's actually happening is every moment that being, the things that really make up that being are born and die, born and die, born and die. Every moment. Conceptual death, this is the one that this verse is talking about These verses are talking about Is when we say this person died, that person died Getting ready for death Where we're going to go when we die That you're going to the realm of death Yama Yama is this being in Buddhist cosmology That waits for you when you die And sort of arranges your travel, I guess I don't know whether it actually happens I, I don't know how Literal, we're supposed to take this, but there's supposed to be these beings who check you in. You've died, okay, you did all these bad things, you're going that way. Oh, you did good things, you're going this way. To your left, to your right. Something like a processing line or something. All of that is conceptual death, because you don't actually die. Just like a person... In a in a whatever this processing line or a, a, uh, an airport, say you're going to Chicago, you're to, going to New York, go this way, go that way. They don't become different people. They just go to different places. They get in different vehicles. So it's like leaving one vehicle, the body, and going into another vehicle, a new body. And this is because. Not because there's a soul, it's not like there's actually a being who goes, but it's because experience continues. Born and die, born and die, born and die. Because reality has nothing to do with this being who was born or dying. What does it mean to say a being is born? It really just means more moments of, of experience. So when we die, nothing changes in that respect. That's why it's called conceptual death, because it's just how we conceive of it. We say, oh, that person died. For them, it's not like that. For them, it can be very confusing and chaotic, but ultimately, it's just more experience. What else could it be? And the third, samucheda marana, is true death. It's, it's death in the ultimate sense. It's the only one of the three that you could really call death, because when you talk about momentary death, there's still more birth The process hasn't died Yes, every experience dies It's gone When you think of something That thought is gone when you finish thinking about it When you hear something The sound is gone when it stops The experience of seeing and hearing and so on That's gone It didn't go anywhere It's just gone, it's died But the process is continuing So it, it's very much like you're still alive that's why we say I'm still alive, why we have this concept of oh I'm alive, oh now they're dead Because we have a feeling, we have the belief that they're no longer experiencing, that that experience chain has ceased It doesn't cease unfortunately um, It doesn't cease meaning we have to come back and we have to continue and repeat all of our mistakes again because we forget everything because memory has a lot to do with uh, circumstance and the brain helps trigger our memories and so on So very easy to forget It's very chaotic and very new And so we're very quick to forget everything For the most part But we continue 
And Samucheda Marana is the only exception that there is the case where it does stop. And where it does stop is because there's fuel that's keeping it on, keeping it going. Why does it continue? When you die, why is there continuation? Why is there any continuity at all? Why does the the mind keep arising? Why does experience continue moment after moment after moment? So experience can continue because of the body. The body can give rise to, can be a catalyst for the arising of experience, just as the mind can be a catalyst for the arising of physical phenomena. They work together in tandem. But there are other factors as well that we can see even in this life. Greed can be a cause for experience. If you want something, then you'll see it. It, it, it blossoms into a whole new set of suffering. I want this, so I'm going to go after it. Maybe you take out a loan and then, boom, you're, you're caught up in that. Maybe you get married. Maybe you have a kid, have children. Maybe you buy things that you then have to take care of, buy a house that you have to care for. Maybe you decide to undertake uh, employment, more employment to get the things you want because of greed. Anger. Maybe you hurt someone, and when you hurt someone, you've created a whole new set of experiences. Those experiences wouldn't have come if you weren't angry, right? If you didn't hurt someone. And they can come from delusion. Maybe you have wrong wrong view, and that wrong view causes you to make mistakes. Maybe you have delusion or ignorance, and because of that ignorance, you make mistakes, and it creates all sort. It blows up into all sorts of experiences that wouldn't have been there. The same can be said of, of good states of mind, but good states of mind don't have the quality of exploding. They're much more focusing. They're much more uh, um, intensifying in terms of strengthening the mind, making the mind clear, making the mind pure. So they don't have this quality of blowing up in your face of... of creating chaos good deeds that's one of the quali one of the qualities that makes them good deeds is that they don't create chaos they don't create uh, extrapolation they don't th they don't create complication for you they simplify they focus they strengthen that's why they that's one of the reasons why they would be called good qualities of mind And so when you die, or even in this life, when you give up those unwholesome qualities of mind, during this life you can see that, wow, a lot of experiences that I would have had now, I don't have any of them. A lot of the complications, we would call them, in my life, those complications aren't there anymore because I've given up all that greed and anger and delusion. And when you give it up entirely, when you die, then there's no there's nothing there's no more physical to give rise to the mind, so all of the all of the reasons for their arising of new mind, new experiences is gone. And so there's a true cessation. This is a person who has, you might say, graduated from samsara. They've gotten to the point where they have no more ambition. And many people this can seem a little bit scary, but and people sometimes recoil from this when they hear that Buddhism talks about this. And so I think it's best to look at this as more a fact than a goal. Not because it isn't worth achieving, but because we can't understand it as being worth achieving. We have so many wants, so many ambitions, so many desires, that it just seems re repulsive to even think about. And so we shouldn't think of it as a goal. It's very difficult, and it can be quite disturbing and, uh, and unpleasant. What we should do is see the complication and see the stress and suffering in our ambitions. And if you look at it that way, then you'll, you'll end up at a point where you have no more ambitions, eventually, maybe in many lifetimes, where you have no greed, no anger, no delusion. 
and without realizing it, you've come to the point where you've graduated. But of course, it's it's much more gradual and it's much more focused on the problem, which is why the Buddha focused on suffering and the cause of suffering. He said, "Look at that. Don't worry about uh, why, um, where it's going to lead, what's going to happen. Look at what's wrong." And and once you know that something's wrong, you can't deny that it it was better. You're better off without it. You can't look back and say, well, that caused me only only suffering. It had absolutely no value to me. But I wish I hadn't gotten rid of it. And it would never happen. So that's what we call samuchida marana. When we, we cut off the causes from further arising. This verse's focus, of course, mostly on the second type, the conceptual death. And it is important, even though it's conceptual, we shouldn't disregard it, as I've talked about. It is a moment, quite a decisive moment, because we have to give up all of the constructs, these sandcastles that we've built, that we hold on to, that we see as a part of who we are, including the body, that we become comfortable with, complacent with even. We have to give it all up, so it's incredibly disruptive. And it's incredibly difficult to be prepared for something so disruptive. One of the things a meditator notices when they practice mindfulness is they become more flexible. They're challenged constantly by things that they didn't expect. Often this is a cause for, for upset in the practice, for stress in the practice, because it's unpredictable. It's, it's chaotic. Right? As a result of focusing on the chaos and, and staying with it, facing it, you become more flexible. You become truly prepared for life and for death. And you see how woefully under, unprepared we are without this kind of training. That without it, when change came, I can see I would have reacted just like this. I would have gotten stressed. I would have gotten upset. If I'm getting up stress, upset and stressed now by such a small change, imagine what would happen if something like death were to happen to me. And so we've become very much prepared. We also deal with a lot of the things that would trip us up when we die. You know how they say when you die, your whole life flashes before your eyes. It seems to be very true that it actually does happen. Not your whole life, but see what we see in meditation is that we carry around a lot of our bad and good karma. All of our, all, a lot of our experiences in life, not all of them. And so your whole life doesn't flash before your eyes. What actually happens that we see in meditation is when you enter into a focused state, which, you know, death is pretty focused because the body is failing. And so when, when, when the body and you know, all the senses in the physical sense start failing and cease, all that's left is a very focused state of mind. As we can see in meditation, when this happens, these things come bubbling to the surface. We remember things that we thought we'd forgotten about, things that are ethically charged or emotionally charged. And we see how those trip us up. We feel good about them or we feel bad about them. And those are the things that you would cling to when you die. So through meditation, a very, very uh, early realization a meditator has is is about this clinging, about this holding on to the past, this realization that we have all these things we haven't let go, we haven't resolved all of these issues that we've been carrying around with us. And meditation helps you resolve them as a result because you're able to see them more clearly and focus on them and face them and become come to terms with them, become more familiar with them to the point that they don't have power over you. When you die, these are the things that will trip us up. If you've done anything beyond 
forgiveness, like killed your parents or killed killed an arahant or something like that, done something just horrible, then that beyond anything else, then then without any hope of mitigating that, when you die, that is what's going to determine your, your next rebirth. It's just some things are so strong that there's no way to avoid their disruption and their forcing the mind into a, an unwholesome state. On, on the other end, if you've done very strong tranquility meditation, it's quite possible for someone who is dying to enter into a very tranquil, peaceful, deep state of mind, which is a great benefit of samatha meditation. And when a person with that kind of focus of mind passes away, they can be, on, on the other hand, born into a very pure state. This is where gods come from, Brahma. The Brahma realms are for people like this. If you haven't done anything so extreme like that, then it's often one of these other things that come up, we see come up in meditation. Something bad you've done, maybe something good you've done, good or bad. Something that you've done, um, starting with something that you did right when you were dying. So if, if when you're dying, you're, you're suppose you're in a knife fight or a gun fight or a soldier or something, all of the stuff that you're doing then, very much ethically charged, is going to have the, the most powerful impact and most likely to be the thing that you cling to and the state of mind that you get stuck in, which will lead to a very unpleasant rebirth. If there's nothing like that, then it's something usually that you've done habitually, like if you're a cow killer, for example, or if you're habitually generous and kind to people. Those are the sorts of things that are going to much more likely to, to determine and to be what you think of, what you hold on to when you pass away, the state of mind uh, that you'll be in when you pass away. If there's none of that, it's often just a random state of mind, something random, something that you've done, katakama it's called, something you did. But all of that, all of that is very much related to the practice of mindfulness. It's, it's all, all what comes up in meditation practice, all of these things, even the very, very strong bad deeds. You can't mitigate certain things, they're too powerful, but with mindfulness you, well, you can, so you can mitigate to some extent, you can cultivate clarity of mind so that you face the consequences of your deeds. It's not that mindfulness helps us escape karma, escape the bad deeds that we've done, because they're done, and the results to some extent are going to be um, certain, fated in a sense. Simply because much of the universe, of course, is out of our control. We're not the masters of the universe, and whatever we send out into the universe, it ripples into everything. If it's something we've done habitually, then we've really changed the universe around us. And that is all going to play a part in our future, of course. But part of, part of the future is, is mindfulness. And through the practice of mindfulness, our relationship with these results, people yelling at us, people reminding us of the things that we've done, our surroundings reminding us of what we've done to get where we are, even our state of mind reminding us of what we've done to get to this state of mind. How we react to these things is very much a part of what determines where we're going to go in the future. And we can be prepared for whatever comes. We can't necessarily change it. But meditation is important and the understanding of death is important for a meditator, not because we should be focused on the future, 
but because it helps us understand why meditation is so valuable. Meditation and, and the practice of mindfulness is so valuable because it actually is a practice that you can say factors in or properly accommodates the truth of death. Unlike a life that is spent indulging in sensuality or reacting to unpleasant situations with anger or clinging to views and arrogance and self-importance and that sort of thing. Is those None of those things properly accounts for or can be said to accommodate the truth of death because all of those things are conducive to an increasing reactivity increased reactivity to the point where when you die and or whenever you're or not just with death whenever you're confronted with a challenge you will react with greed with anger with delusion with all these things that will cause you to react improperly to react in ways that lead to your own stress and suffering not to mention that of others So the verse describes us as being unprepared for death and that we should work wayama. We should we should exert ourselves, keep on quickly. Pandita pandito bhava. Wise up, become a pandita, become a wise one. Wisdom of course is the best preparation. The Buddha reminds us here that this is the way forward, the way to prepare ourselves for anything, not to dwell worrying about the future, what might happen. Exert yourself in wisdom. Cultivate the one thing that will prepare you for anything. Wisdom is not of a nature to know about every single thing that might happen. It's rather to understand the nature of things which is a very general truth. There is a set of general truths about everything that might happen to us, anything that might arise. There's a set of general truths that apply to them all and are sufficient for allowing you to be prepared for anything that might come, as we call the Four Noble Truths. Suffering, the cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering and the path which frees us from suffering. If you understand those four, not intellectually, but through the practice, you understand the nature of experience, and you understand what happens when you react in specific ways, then you've done your duty. There are experiences and there are reactions or interactions, approaches to experience, which is basically the Four Noble Truths. If you approach experience, relate to experience in a certain way, it leads to suffering. If you relate to experience in a, in a different way, or in the opposite way, of course it doesn't lead to suffering, or it leads to a cessation of suffering, and all that's left is peace. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. An important verse that not, not only helps us, I said it, it was mainly to help us remember why we should practice, but also helps us think about practice, the nature of practice, why death is so important, why we are unprepared for death, but also how we prepare for death, or how we practice in such a way that one couldn't say we should be concerned for death. A person who practices rightly has no reason to fear death or be concerned for, the, for anything that might come, simply because they are prepared for anything. They have done the work, they have become wise, and their wisdom is their greatest weapon. Someone who, you, who has wisdom can never be defeated 
It can be seen in some sense as invincible. There's nothing that could possibly make them suffer because there's nothing that they would ever be disturbed by, be taken off guard by, caught off, be caught off guard by, ready for anything, seeing everything as just arising and ceasing, seeing everything as merely an experience and understanding that reaction, clinging all of that is merely a cause for greater suffering so that's the Dhammapada thank you all for listening wish you all the best